All right. Hey, I've got a I've got a guest on the channel. Hey, Quinn, say hello to everyone. Hey, YouTube, how's it going? <laughs> Dude, Quinn is a Quinn sent me a message. Actually, he left me a comment, and I asked him to send me an email. And Quinn is a we're calling him the PVE Dreamer because uh, Quinn's played a ton of uh, World of Warcraft TCG uh, and particularly played a lot of the PVE elements of World of Warcraft. Right? That's that's kind of your. You, Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, pretty much like a kind of weekly event or like after school kind of event every day. Kind of meet in the library, test out the raid decks, learn how to beat it, uh, beat the boss once and for all. Some of those decks would take two or three weeks to actually accomplish and actually defeat. Um, but yeah, that that's the experience every week. So I thought it'd be awesome because I don't. I've never played like a TCG PVE mode. Like I've played Magic and I've played you know a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh growing up, but never a PVE. I've played some board games that are PVE, so I don't really know anything about that subject but i know everyone's kind of excited about the idea of flesh and blood pve there's been some rumors we kind of talked off camera bronson did a video about it and yeah he kind of asked some people on reddit who were there when they did the test and so if you if you haven't checked out bronson's video on that make sure you go after this or whatever and go check out bronson's blood and check out his video talking about uh kind of what people did uh but when i saw that i was like oh man it'd be so cool but i don't know anything about it and then quinn kind of hit me up and so I want to get a I want to get a PVE dreamers uh, opinion and ideas on what could be PVE uh, come whenever they announce that for Flesh and Blood because I think it's inevitable. So I'm just gonna kind of let Quinn talk. I'm gonna ask him some questions, but this could be mostly about Quinn. So Quinn, why don't you tell us how you got into trading card games for a couple minutes, and then we'll hop into the the PVE stuff. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's uh. That's pretty much my entire life. <laughs> um. I'm trying to think where and when. I think it's third grade when Pokemon came uh, to the U.S. and hits. And I started with the, the Pokemon TCG into Yu-Gi-Oh into Magic in middle school. Tried the Marvel versus system. The WoW TCG came in high school when I was still playing Magic. Um. We also moved on to Dragon Ball Super for a little bit for casual fun after graduation. And then this year, kind of jumped into Flesh and Blood when I saw it on YouTube, and I was like actually reminds me of the wow tcg sadly i had the whole avatar the gear play your character and like be invested and get engaged in the content and based on the overall design of the game i just had that what if mentality of what could come from this design and this setup um so that's my whole history i've, I've played at least eight nine ten tcgs plus tabletop gaming um so seeing where this game itself can develop and go seeing the previous possibilities and the precedent of the past i'm pretty excited to see what we can do with this that's awesome. And so you've played both PVE, but also like regular card games, like, you know, like you said, Pokemon and whatever. And so, so flesh and blood, you saw it and you're like, I'm super excited about the competition. Right. But then, oh, you right, start, yeah. then you start saying, but it also seems like it's set up perfectly for a PVE. Exactly. So like when I first got into flesh and blood, um, I'm kind of the kid who cried wolf. Every time a new game comes out, I'm like, Oh, Hey guys, look, look, try this, try this. It's yeah. going to be fun. This is going to be great. And they drop a hundred bucks. Yeah, this is awesome. This is cool. Three months later, new game, you know, kind of yeah. push it to the wayside. And uh, you kind of get that point where you come across like the golden goose and you see flesh and blood. And I was like, oh, I oh, know, guys, seriously, I, I'm not joking. Like, you, you need to try this game. I was like, I, I know I, I cry wolf all the time saying like, hey, try this one or try that one. Um, but seriously, you need to try this. They're like, oh, no, it's one of those years. I'm like, OK, well, how about this? I'll build the decks because I had it in the back of my mind, like, what if we do get that kind of like PVE concept? I would want to have like one of every class kind of set up, ready to go. And uh, so I went ahead and built like the Guardian, the Ranger, the the Rune Blades, uh, the Wizard, and the Mechanologist, like right out the gate within the first two or three months of like Arcane Rising being out, ready to kind of push that. And so every time I go visit friends in different parts of the state, I'll bring the decks with me. I was like, hey, let's just try a game. I make everything blitz so it's a little easier to kind of comprehend and learn the, ro the routine. And uh, slowly and surely, they're like, okay, this is fun. I'm, I'm glad you built it so I don't have to waste any money. I was like, I I'm glad I built it. Like, believe me. Yeah. In the long run, it was a good investment. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, slowly awesome. and surely, doing like the, the whole, uh, we haven't done a multiplayer yet because everyone's still kind of learning the basics every time I kind of visit and see them. Right. Um, but we've been doing a lot of the one-on-one -on -one blitz, and they're, they're starting to grasp that a lot, a lot more. And so I'm getting a lot That's more cool. people. So. And is this the same play group that you, you've played the WoW PvE content with? Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, Magic, The Gathering, EDH, all of the above for the last anywhere from seven to 13 years. Definitely. Cool. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your whatever your favorite. I think it is. Wow. The PVE. Like, tell us a little bit about how that works and the similarities, differences kind of to flesh and blood. OK, so in general, um, when you're playing the WoW TCG, the best way to think about it is Magic the Gathering. It runs off the same kind of engine development design. So you start your turn untap draw 
your action phases. There's no real main phase one combat, main phase two. It's just do all the things you want to do, and then you have like a cleanup step. Uh-huh. Um, so when you're playing against like in the raid environments, um, I think the usually the raid boss goes first. They'll draw their starting hands, and based on what raid you're doing, so I think the two I'll reference today mostly would be Molten Core and Onyxia's Lair. Um, one is that single boss encounter, and the other one is more of that battle of attrition, go from one boss to the next. And so like with the Onyxia's Lair setup, um, they have a resource system as well, but it's not like play a land or something face down from your hands. They have an event deck, and so you pretty much start their turn, flip the card over, here's your events. This thing happens. It could mm. be good. It could be really bad. It could be instantaneous, or it could be a lasting effect until that boss's next turn. So you kind of reveal it. The ability, ability goes in the stack. That goes down as a resource, and they kind of cast and tap accordingly. Is that um, kind but of the like, decks, Is that kind of like in Magic the Gathering? You've got the plane chase, where when you plane chase somewhere, something can happen. Honestly, I never played it. So that's okay, like the gotcha. one, the one thing I never actually. It, touched. it seems like so. The idea is you 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 flip something over, and something affects everybody. Okay. Is it, okay, so that'd be more like the events. That seems similar, yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Okay, because um, it, it, it honestly it could be beneficial or it could be just treacherous and devastating. Yeah, uh, it could be like all heroes heal ten health. I'm like, oh good, we were almost dead anyway. <laughs> yeah, or it could be like all heroes discard their hands. You're like, okay, well there went our plans. Right. Um, and so that's the typical routine of the deck. And then with Anixia's Lair, it also had phases. So phase one would have like twenty health. Like phase two might have like thirty health, and phase three might have fifty health. And then certain things will trigger and occur within each of those phases. And then there's also certain abilities that can only be activated within those phases. So you had to kind of be conscious of what abilities were coming your way and how to interact with the raid deck. Um, so there's constant interaction with the players around you. Usually you kind of came up with like a whole group party setup. Usually someone was trying to mitigate all the damage. You had like your DPS classes, damage per second. And then you had like your healing support individual who's trying to make sure no one got nuked by the player. Because yeah. obviously like, when you have that person piloting the raid deck, if there's something that they're kind of worried about, it's like, oh, well, we have, you know, uh, the wizard deck and the rogue deck. So I want to be able to cast my deep breath. And so I have to make sure they can't interrupt me. Some of try to prioritize nuking those people. So you got your tank trying to taunt, mitigate one version of attacks while the other one's trying to help hor- uh, heal and support the other person being attacked. Right. Um, so you had to have that whole group camaraderie kind of playing around. So it's, is there a limit to the number of players? There isn't. Um, I think the, the, the raid decks themselves were designed around having three to five players to play against. So anywhere a party of four to six, give or take, total. Okay. Um, the one person piling the deck, and then three to five people on a team. And obviously they said the more people you add, the easier it is to kind of defeat that boss. Right. So the person piloting the deck, are they playing as well, or are they like the DM like in Dungeons & Dragons? No, they're playing. Everything they do is their choice. Who they attack, who they uh, cast spells on, everything. So okay, they're literally playing to hit you out. They are the enemy. Yes. So there's a game called Imperial Assault from, uh, from Fantasy Flight Fantasy Studios. Flight Studios. Yep. That's Star Wars, right? And it's four heroes versus the fifth player is the Empire. And they're trying to beat all four of the heroes. The four heroes are trying to beat the Empire. That's how this that's is? exactly it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So th- let me ask you this. It, it, before we get into comparing it to Flesh and Blood, because that's what we're going to be okay. doing, right? But it you've obviously have you played as the as the bad bad guys the guy who's running oh, absolutely. The, okay yeah. is it fun is that fun oh absolutely, Why absolutely. Is that fun? It, um because it's sometimes it's just fun to crush dreams in a very healthy <laughs> environment and so when you're watching everyone have their plans um they're, they're always trying to like they're conniving they're working together and they're trying to destroy your day and like well i'm gonna destroy their day and so it's it's funny when you can kind of sit there and just bluff the hands like Okay, um, let's just go ahead and do this. And I'll, I'll I'll pass turn, and you come to your next turn. It's like, oh, you fell into my trap, you know. And I'm gonna cast this and this and this, and they're just like, that yeah. was all of our allies, all of our equipment. It's all just gone, destroyed. Okay, great. What do we do now? And so you just kind of dream crush. It's like, hey, you didn't see that coming. It's like playing the game of commander, more or less. It's just, well, as as long as you play the politics correctly, the game of commander is usually like one v one v one v one. But sometimes you play the wrong card, it's one v three very quickly. Sure. Um, so it kind of falls into that environment. So do you as the so as the uh, the bad guys the the deck right as the raid boss do you have to set up things like in Dungeons and Dragons right you have to like pr- prepare and like be and show up ready to go and even in the Fantasy Flight game uh, of Imperial Assault like you have to like know what you're doing or is this like you show up and you're kind of playing uh, you you build your own deck as the 
do you, I guess what I'm asking is, do you build your own deck as the bad guys or is the deck built as the bad guys and you're just kind of seeing what happens and then making decisions as you go? Good question. Um, it's actually all pre-built. Uh, I have an example kind of right here. Um, like with the WoW TCG, um, there's actually like a whole player deck right here. So they gave you like one that the, the, the enemy player just constantly uses throughout the entire game. Yeah. Uh, they give you a stack of minions and tokens to use um, for the final boss. There's also like a 25 card deck for that one. Um, and then like one of the hidden abilities, like with the runes, there's a whole little rune deck to activate as you go as well. So everything's um, fully orchestrated ahead of time. And you kind of play into it once you kind of read the rule book and know how the turn should resolve. And you still have the ability to make the game kind of go one way or another. You're just making the decisions that they kind of give to you. In a sense, yeah. So you're, yeah. you're kind of timing like when, when to go big or, or when to hold back. Okay. So you, you kind of control when you kind of go deep. And as the enemy player, you're playing to win, right? Like you're not playing like in Dungeons and Dragons as a DM, right? Like you're kind of like, I want to make it really difficult for my party, but I want them to succeed. But in this, you're like, I want to make it really hard and I want to win absolutely absolutely that's, 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 oh, that's really the best it. part because as a so dm get, like as a dm yeah. you're like i want to kill you but i can't because it will ruin two years of a party you know what i mean like two years exactly. of the experience okay cool. and so yeah we, we sit in the library and it's like we're going we're going to do this today guys we're going to do it because usually what we do is one person would pilot the deck until we actually beat it um, which kind of just helped them perfect their skills as well and it's like when we kind of did like a rotation after that and they were kind of in the player party they kind of had an idea of how to kind of get around certain spells or abilities or know what to watch out for. They kind of knew from their experience what they were holding as a big threat. Hmm. Okay, so now let's bring in Flesh and Blood, right? We're, we're kind of 12 minutes into the episode. Okay. We, we've got an idea of World of Warcraft, you know, the, the idea of the, the PvE mode. Uh, and then you said at the beginning that the first time you really started playing Flesh and Blood, there were things that were like, this could be a perfect PvE game. What what were Absolutely. the what were the things that stood out to you as like it being a perfect PVE game? So I think one of the biggest dead set giveaways is like with any kind of RPG, like you 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 need an avatar, you need a presence in the game, and like one of the first things I attached to um, in Flesh and Blood was like Bravo. Like I saw Bravo, and it's like I just want to smack something with a hammer, like a big dragon, a Leviathan, some goblins. I don't know what it is, but it's just his presence there it, it feels like you're in the game. Referencing back to like Magic the Gathering, like obviously with, with Magic, like you're the planeswalker, you're the player, but you never feel represented on the on the board or the field. Like it's like there's almost nothing at stake for you except for just losing. Yeah. Um, and so like in this game, you're watching your, your character kind of die and you're thinking about the consequences. I think it kind of works with the psychology there. Um, so definitely having like this hero avatar that's the center of the game that represents you, I think kind of helps put you in the element of the RPG. Um, secondly, um, specializations. Um, speaking of specializations um, between the two games, um, when we get into some of the challenges later on, um, I'll show you one of the uh, World of Warcraft specialization cards that, like, for a healer, for example, that we'll kind of reference later on. Um, that will be uh, Lightwell from the TCG. Um, the specializations kind of tie yourself to like a class or a hero. Uh, so seeing like Bravo and then seeing um, Crippling Crush, you're just like, oh. Oh, like that that's his ability. Like this mm. is what he brings to the fights. Um, so there's that choice later on down the road. Um, another similarity is like the the gears and the, and the weapon, like you, you come fully equipped for battle. And so in the wild TCG you had that. However, they were built into your deck and so you had to kind of draw them, cast them when the time came about. Um, and then lastly, like the, the spells and abilities, like so your heroes are constantly interacting with one another. In regards to those differences, um, the, the big ultimate difference uh, besides how the resources in the game function um, would be like minions and allies. Um, so like Magic the Gathering, you could actually summon allies to be like protectors, more aggressive like haste creatures. And in, in a raid setting, uh, sometimes your allies were the ones that actually pushed the content forward for you. It wasn't mm. just you being a hunter shooting a bow. It was you being a hunter shooting a bow, throwing four worgen into play that were attacking for four, five, six, or seven to kind of push the boss into the next phase. Um, but lastly, the, the big major difference, obviously, is like the engine. Um, the way I kind of look at Magic the Gathering, it's got that ramp up, that turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four. Uh, WoW TCG was the same way. Whereas if we kind of look at Flesh and Blood, it's, it's more of a ramp down. Like once you start yeah. burning through your hot spells and your lukewarm spells to your cold spells, you're kind of just like you're kind of throwing one point of damage here and there. 
Um, and that will be very important when it comes to the challenges as to like what could be an issue with the PVE content going forward with, with that possibility. Because in the um, PVE, usually as the game goes, you need to get better in order to fight the harder boss or whatever it is. Interesting. Okay. Right. Um, um, two other little things. Um, roles. Like there's not really roles in this game. Like everyone's a DPS right now, right? But if we mm. know from the, the, the lore book, there's a cleric there. Right. Well, the cleric might be more of that D and D style cleric, where they're kind of sword and shield, hammer, ready to go, but they have a little bit of passive healing on the side. Um, we don't know how deep down the rabbit hole that kind of uh, that kind of teamwork um, element that the cleric might have will go when it comes to design space. Um, and then, like the last thing is like timing and interaction. Um, without a lot more like instant abilities that can actually do more devastating effects on your opponent's turn you're kind of limited to purely like I attack on my turn, I defend on your turn, mm. uh, which some classes have started to kind of change the status quo on that as well. Right. So interesting. So do you feel like, I guess another question I would have, you've kind of said the um, getting worse and worse as it goes. What about the idea of finding new equipment or something like that throughout the game? Because I think one of the things that has been talked about a lot is, uh, the, the similarities to uh, what's the video game that everybody compares it to? Um, Diablo and Diablo, Path right. of Exile. Right. Yep. So as you're playing the game, could, do you think possibly something that could happen is your your deck, right? Your PVE deck has some loot, right, that you could locate right. that would be specific that wouldn't be used in the PvP. It wouldn't it wouldn't kind of upset the battle in terms of like competitive gameplay but you could get some sort of like killer weapon or really cool boots or whatever that right, are right. in the pve that are specific to that deck is that something that you think could happen i actually wrote something like that down for you <laughs> nice um so absolutely um i would not see something like that happen in like the singular raid environment um but when we get into that what if like with the dungeon crawl because i think it's really hard if you look at the sustainability of flesh and blood and content right now how many cards heal um, so you have Sigil of Solace, you have Sunkiss, uh, Tomb of Findal, uh, that really the, the major potion. ones at this Isn't point. Isn't one of the potion? Is one of the potions I don't, too? No. No, I think potions, you have the resources, the action points, and the attack power. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, Crazy Brew. I think potentially Crazy Brew can heal you. Yeah. But. It also has but, a negative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The pros and cons, right? Yeah. Um, so th those are our options right now. So there's plenty of design space for that to kind of broaden. Um, the horizon um, but like right now we don't have any kind of like healing support class um if you want to we can go ahead and move in some potential challenges we have to worry about um yeah the, the, the biggest thing that i see is like roles like who's doing what mm -hmm. um so what we know from the the uh, the prototype that they brought to last year's tournament uh, apparently it was kind of um this whole like beat it in the face and hopefully you beat it before it beats you right it was um, like basically a sponge right like you just right it was like a, did you ever play uh uh destiny the, mm -hmm. the video yeah. game right like all the raid bosses or whatever not the raid bosses but all the uh the kind of secondary bosses were just like how fast can you shoot something you're just yeah. like standing yeah there, like, just kind of <laughs> going at it, going at it, getting there getting there slowly yeah and it's like terribly yeah. boring uh yeah. until the raid bosses those were a ton of fun but yeah, that's kind of why I gathered from it. The idea was like you're just beating it down and you kind of have a timer. Right. And so I would argue how fun is that? Not. I think that's absolutely boring. Um, Especially when think... you compare what the standard is for Flesh and Blood and what James White has kind of said right. they're trying to do, right? Like. And so I feel like that prototype was more of like a test dummy to kind of see how people interact with it, how fast damage could be put out by professional players. Um, to see how they need to kind of balance that going forward. Mm -hmm. I can see that being like a final boss in a series of like five or six interactions. And so you're kind of going through that dungeon crawl or whatever else, and you get to the the Goblin King's lair, and you're kind of trying to beat him for the last treasure chest or whatever. And so that's that final, hey, so you, you've gathered things through the first six, seven corridors. Here's the final boss. You've got five turns to beat him. What can you do with what you've gathered? And so you have to kind of coordinate, team up, and kind of be able to blast through that damage last minute or else good try try it again tomorrow right um so yeah I, I think like the roles of like how are you putting out the damage are we, are we looking at all classes being uh strictly damage uh going forward are we looking at any of them kind of being utility and by utility i mean like looking at the wizard for example like aether eyes like it's the only counter spell that we have in the game um when i play the wild tcg 
Um, there are certain spells that were like, hey, uh, kill all allies, destroy all equipment, and destroy all abilities for mm. six, seven resources. And something like that would devastate the entire board. And so you've put five, six, seven turns of ramping up your, your, your army, more or less, between four or five players. And you're trying to get that one-shot kill next turn before it, it does something back to you. Um, they cast one spell like that. You don't have the right card in place at the right time. The game's just reset, and you're like, well, how do we recuperate in the course of two or three turns to overcome right. this threat? At this point, they have tempo. Um, so little yeah. interrupts, interactions like that. And that seems to be the balance of flesh and blood, too, right? Instead of – it is all about tempo. It's all about initiative, right? Whoever is – whoever has the most cards in their hand is typically on the board for kind of, like, finishing the game out. And you're kind of in this constant battle of, like, holding on to cards. It is not just boom, 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 boom. Uh, I take some damage. Boom, boom. It's always like that idea of how can you save yourself for initiative. So you're saying right. that, that that would make it that's a that's a almost a weakness in a PVE because it's so easy for the big boss to take initiative. Potentially. Yes, in a sense. Yeah, okay. because it, depending on how they want to balance it, for example. So do they want these raid bosses doing massive amounts of damage, or do, do they want them having more of, like, Bravo um, abilities, like making them discard cards, or, like, having weird side effects, like can't draw cards this turn, kind of like how the crush mechanic works? Because uh, I could definitely see a, a dragon having crush built in, just, okay, yeah, so here's, here's the consequence. Um, versus, like, Intimidate being a thing, kind of pulling cards out of someone's hands until, like, their next turn. Yeah. Or they want other kind of crowd control effects, like you can't use your weapons until your next round, so you can devastate a ninja or a warrior like that very easily. Um, so do they want it to be, I'm going to deal massive amounts of damage, and you have to kind of race me to the finish? Or is it, I'm going to deal consistent damage, knowing that a lot of people can't really heal efficiently through it, and then mm -hmm. kind of limit people and crowd control them to kind of control the tempo of the game, and you have to kind of overcome these little obstacles I'm throwing out at you at the same time? Right. Um, so how do they want to balance that is really the ultimate question. Interesting. And so the, in my mind, when I think of a raid boss in a video game or, you know, I've played, like I said, Imperial Assault, there was movement and there was a board, right? Like the raid boss right. moves around and then, you know, you have to turn around and shoot him over there or whatever. Or in Imperial Assault, you would, everybody would move one way and then all of a sudden the, the Empire player could like pop in, you know, uh, who knows, uh, R not R2-D2, what's the guy's name? The... Anyway, pop in yeah. a, a Empire, whatever, the, the Royal Army over here, and then you're kind of screwed. It, okay. how, does, how does, like, that work in a card game? Like, how, I guess I'm saying, like, as the bad guy, do you have the ability to, like, dodge or to, um, to flank or to do any of those things? Or are you, and how does that affect with flesh and blood, I guess is what I'm getting at. So are you asking like the design space where potentially could that go if they wanted to actually have counter maneuvers, kind of like if the dragon yeah. were playing like a warrior with attack reactions, defense reactions, how do they want to kind of interact yeah. with the opponent surprisingly? Uh, so I did this little uh, handy drawing of potentially like a what if kind of uh, board state yeah. um, when it comes to like the symmetry because flesh and blood I think is really good for their like design space of like keeping the, the mats and, the, and everything else looking very clean and unified, like everything has a purpose and a place. Um, so with the design I did for this potential dragon deck, I think a lot of the RNG has to come from potentially having like events. And so what I was okay. thinking of, you want, you want to have like a timer built into it, right? Um, so every time the, the, the raid boss deck kind of goes, you pop an event. Like in the WoW TCG, that could be good, could be bad. And what you do is you keep like three event board spaces. And then from there, one takes over space one, second one comes over, takes over space two, third one comes out, takes over space three. When the fourth one pops, whether good or bad, the enemy team, the allied players, will kind of choose, hey, which event do we want to kind of overwrite to kind of move things back in our favor? And you can choose if there's one that's really, really bad and devastating. Maybe you've had that since turn one. Maybe that's on turn four. Oh. Just replace it and get things back in your control. Hmm. Um, when it comes to the damage output, I was thinking, like, well, if we, if we have a dragon, um, wouldn't a dragon be kind of like naturally with like arcane barriers, just part of the card, maybe part of the hero card itself. So they naturally consistently always have arcane barrier. So maybe your wizards in the group, even though they bring great utility, they're just weak in this kind of circumstance. So it goes back to that party aspect. How do we want to build this? Mm. Um, with the dragon deck as well, I had like a left claw and a right claw. So maybe they play kind uh, of like yeah. the berserker does. And so maybe they just naturally have go again. So you go first swipe, second swipe. Um, there's a little hidden compartment here that I did below the character card. Maybe that's a, uh, like a hidden like trap zone, more or less, like a, a tail sweep 
or some kind of surprise attack that kind of works as like an alternate uh, arsenal zone. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And then, and then lastly, I was like, well, like gear is really crucial to this game. And so if you think like dragons, I was thinking back to like a WoW um, raiding fight. That was like the fall of Deathwing. He had like jump on his back and like blow the plates off in order to kind of knock him out of the sky into the maelstrom. Oh. So what if you have these dragon scales that he uses armor? And so your strategy is like the, 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 the wizards trying to counteract the abilities, keep the dragon under control. Your guardians and your warriors are just nailing at those plates, trying to work those down. They have battle warns. They start with like four or five armor. Yeah. You're just trying to use those blocks up as much as you can to kind of wear the dragon down. Their deck works the same as ours. They have a pitch zone. They have a graveyard. They have an exile. Um, so the dragon player can be smart. They can start stacking their deck just like we're stacking ours. Um, sweet. They're, they're pitching the same way. Um, maybe all their spells have a guaranteed like two block instead of a three to two ratio. Um, but like we're trying to work around and they're playing under the same engine that we're playing under. Um, you're just kind of approaching it completely different. It's just one super powered individual versus three or four heroes. Um, that's so awesome. That's, that's, so you can that's target instead of just targeting like in in our in the game, right? You can't target the person's armor, but you're right. saying in 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 the PVE, maybe you have that as almost multiple different characters of the enemy that you can say to strategize and say no let's take out his armor first and then maybe you don't win right like maybe you die and then you guys are like all right you guys want to try to move forward again tomorrow and you show up tomorrow and you re-strategize and say no what if we target this armor first because it was giving it you know uh, arcane barrier and that's what we need to take care of so that our wizard can do something and then you move on and you're like oh yeah we got it and then you've kind of conquered that part and then you can move on to the next one more or less, right? Uh, so the card I kind of chose specifically for something like this was a Magnetic Shockwave. Um, pretty important card for something like this. Um, I didn't think directly about being able to attack the armor, but I think that's a great alternative. It makes the Ranger class kind of useful for once. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have like Ranger classes able to kind of start poking at the armor or something like that, or maybe like your Mechanologist can use their pistols, because maybe the dragon's not on the ground, maybe it's flying, who knows what's happening. Um, but Magnetic Shockwave could actually force them to kind of expose their armor in a sense and kind of push them into wasting the battle worn off of it sooner rather than later so maybe your, your your choice for what classes you want in your party can really start playing into how you want to approach your, your group composition um everyone's gonna have pros and cons right but what works best for your team and your group and what's your strategy right that's awesome i i love that kind of dynamic of like trying to conquer it and losing right like and, and did you find when you were playing the that you know the WoW one w was losing sometimes more fun than winning because you were like it was that much more difficult and then like you got the, like was it like if you just like got through it all and didn't really struggle at all were you like that was too easy and then you're like when you actually lost a couple and then defeated it was that better? Yeah, I, losing didn't ever really feel bad. Um, the one time we were in college, like we, we started playing, this, or I started playing this back in 2007, I think. I think this released 2006, 2007, and that's what we were playing in high school. And I remember beating Onyxia's Lair, but we never actually beat Molten Core. And then when we got in college, you know, we're kind of like, "Hey, you guys, uh, you remember this game over here?" Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And we used like some of our spare money, sold a couple Magic cards, and went on eBay and bought the cards we were missing and went to play it. Um, back to that key point, we never actually bought any interrupt cards. And uh, we went in um, trying to take down the raid bosses, and we're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they cast that one spell. It's like, Whoop. wipes yeah. the board. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need some interrupts. We got to be able to control what's happening here. We need some more interaction. So and maybe so, some of these cards that we're not seeing used in the PvP modes of Flesh and Blood are specific for that to kind of answer that. You were kind of saying that with Aetherize, right? Like where it's like Absolutely. Aetherize is negate target ability or something like that. I can pull it uh, negate target instant with cost one or less. Yeah. yeah. So the card's not being used right now and maybe that's one of the reasons is that, that it exists is not for PvE but more for the, the sorry, not for PvP but more for the PvE. Interesting. Absolutely. Um one one last thing I would note on the wizard, very interestingly, they're the only class right now that has any sort of AOE, as far as I know. There might be others. I, 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 as far as I know, uh, elaborate on what AO, AOE means. Area, area of, of effect. effect. Right? Okay. Area yeah. of effect. Not for um, me. Not for me. I know what I'm talking yeah. about, people. Come on, I don't. come on, guy. I don't. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, the area of effect is a very, very crucial part of a PVE environment. If you go past just only having heroes and going into like minions or villains, depending on how the semantics of what kind of label or type you want to use for cards going down the road. Um, Chain Lightning itself actually reads, if you have played another wizard non-attack action card this turn, deal three arcane damage to each opposing hero. Mm. Uh, so if we went towards like a dungeon crawl and you're summoning like you you, you encounter like a pack of goblins for example are, are they going to label those as like mini heroes to kind of bridge the semantical gap there uh, and make it be able to target something like that or will those be minions and will be new cards printed to kind of deal with small groups of two three four health mobs that might come across in the future um, so will there potentially be erratas like how, how do they want to handle the verbiage on something like that mm. So yeah, so some of those cards that you, we thought maybe were just for like the the uh, ultimate fight pay or ultimate pit fight, I never get right. Where we're like, right. that's that's the main use for that card, right? Like a chain lightning actually mm -hmm. has a bigger use in a PVE. Potentially, absolutely, based on how they want to design it and word it. Interesting, I like it. I like it a lot. So uh, why don't you show us your map again? And you want to elaborate okay. a little bit on what could be? I'm I'm interested in that, and uh, I've got it pulled up so you can kind of point and and. Okay. Whatever. You got so, it. So yeah. So tell me. I'll, okay. I'll, I can ask about it. Um, okay. Oh wait. I, should I screenshot that? I didn't screenshot it. Just keep it oh. up there for me. Sorry. I don't You're know good. how to. I don't know how to do that on a PC. All right. So tell me what the uh, the D and the RC is right there in the middle. Okay. So that would be like the dragon. Uh, okay. With two weapons. Okay. Um. Down below, straight below the dragon, would be like the the hidden trap zone. A kind of like tail sweep mechanic. Whatever you want to do there. Okay. So um, we're seeing that. we're seeing the play zone as it stands on a play mat from the enemy side more or less yes okay um then you would have below the question mark uh, the hidden like trap zone is the arsenal um uh, to give them basic functionality there with like, holding an ability back for the following turn um around that the four little pieces would be like the scales um, potentially oh, cool. with like four or five armor however you want to balance that um to the one side where you see the e that would be like the event zone um, where you flip events one two and three and then every turn you flip like another event out to kind of add a new element to the battle to kind of help it keep fresh rng you never know that one battle is going to play the same as the next. Uh, then lastly, the opposite zone is what we're always used to, where you have the typical um, deck zone where you have the pitch pile, the graveyard, and the exile zone. Um, so that's pretty much the basic setup. That's awesome. I love it. I Dude, I, I really like, like, I I don't know what will happen, but I really, really hope that you are right about the, like, the scales and, like, the ability to do things. Do you think, if, if you were designing it, designing it would you do things like you get to choose as the enemy what scales you have? Like, could you play as a dra It tells you, pick a dragon, and you have four dragons to choose from, and it has different... You know, like in Flesh and Blood, you can you can see your enemy's deck before you choose your equipment, right? Like, I, Right, uh, right. So it, as the enemy, you would be like, this is what I'm playing as, and then the heroes can kind of, you know, they can... Or maybe even there's research that you can do over time, like in a, an event, you capture an idea that a dragon coming up is going to have uh rune or uh what am i talking about the uh the blocking ar arc blocking arcane barrier okay right? and so you you strategize based on that would you like to see the ability to change that up as the enemy <clears throat> or would you like it to be like a set kind of standard thing I will always argue for something regarding variability or change. I don't think there's ever a, a moment where you have too many options. Um, well, maybe there is, you know, you don't make it too convoluted. Um, but I would love to see. So one thing we wanted to talk about as well was like difficulty. Like how do you range difficulty between like three and five players? Mm. What if the dragon type you choose is part of that? So within their decks, maybe their damage is amped up. So maybe a blue dragon um, is more hateful and spiteful towards like arcane users. And so it naturally has more built-in mechanics to handle magic damage. So you want to approach it with more physical damage. Mm. Uh, then you have like a red dragon, a black dragon, find like a gold dragon, something very rare. It's like it has a lot of immunities and extra special effects. And that's like your epic mode. Like, okay, you beat these three dragons. Can you beat this one? Mm. Um, so having a raid deck that has four potential difficulties, like that would be amazing. Like talk about replayability. That would, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, and you could even like the scales, right? Like if it if it was a five player game, the the rules could say dragon gets four scales, whereas opposed mm -hmm. to if it's a three player game, the dragon gets two scales, right? And you can, right. or it's like the dragon gets to choose between five different types of armor, or, you know, weapon, armor, whatever. And if it's more people, it gets six or seven or something like that. That's really cool. Like I love the way that that could scale. 
Um, and even like with that, that question mark zone, maybe that's the one variability as well. Like what ex extra special things you have, what do you have in your treasure trove as a dragon, like a collector of special things? What's your hidden mechanic this fight? And you can yeah. kind of bring that up as another variable as well. I agree that, uh, that it shouldn't be too convoluted because I will say as somebody who played like the Imperial Assault, whatever, I didn't like that I had to do the research before. Not that I, I'm not being lazy, but like, I don't need to be the DM and like completely pick everything and have to spend five hours before and before a six hour night of playing cards. To Let me get my uh, 15 tiles up and lay it out on the table and yeah. get all the dice. Oh, sorry. Here's the extra tokens. Let me get these for you. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't love that. You know what I mean? Like I, I like the idea of, Hey, here, spend half an hour while, while the, uh, while the opponents, while the good guys are kind of talking strategy, like spend half an hour thinking through what your deck looks like and make some decisions that affect the game or make it more interesting, but don't require you to do a bunch of planning and organizing and like set up. And you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just don't want to see too much. Honestly, I hadn't played the raid decks in so long. I had to sit down and reread the rule book just to relearn like the, the, the proper turn order and organization of it. And I think in like 10 minutes of reading, like everything just came back to me. That's um, awesome. I, think, I think that's the beauty of a lot of the card games as well. As long as you recognize the basic turn order, what the zones are and how the zones trigger. Um, looking at the drawing, there's like 20 potential piles of cards. I can see that being difficult the first time. Um, but like I think they like they argue with like flesh and blood. I think it's easy to learn but hard to master. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think overall the game, the overall engine, I, I don't think it would be too difficult. But I think it just looks more overwhelming than it actually is. What do you think? Uh, sorry, we can get to more things if you want to do specifics. But what do you think about the idea of it being a way to teach new players how to play the game? Because right now that seems to be what the community is most worried about. Right is bringing new players into the game and for something like a pve where uh you can be on a team so i think it would be perfect in my mind right like uh, i can get my me and my buddy who both have played flesh and blood and i could be the enemy or he could be the enemy and then i could be kind of like the team leader and be working to help the other three people if it's a four on one helping the other three people play the game and teaching them do you think that there's a transitional point that this could help teach people how to play just flesh and blood like all like pvp pve could help them learn how to play or do you think that the rules would have to change so much that you would you want to understand how to play the pvp content i think the rules would pretty much be the same the only th the only complication in the pve structure is the actual boss deck itself okay um so even with the wild tcg um the the way you played in the raid setting was the way you played in a pvp matchup it was the same term order same priorities you're just trying to deal damage to them control their allies it worked the exact same way um so the only person who has to actually know more rules would be the actual boss player itself who's actually awesome. controlling the event deck and things like that and so here's what i would propose to you um it's been a long time since we've had friday night magic um and i, I kind of miss having that social environment um when you went to an FNM, what did you see? Like, you, you usually saw, like, the typical table set aside for the FNM setup. But, like, what was happening on the outskirts? What did you typically see? Uh, people eating food. Uh, okay. Did you ever see any kind of EDH games or anything like that going on? Yeah. I mean, always. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, people and playing D&D, so, &D, though, too. At my LGS, there's a big D&D &D table. It's, you know, usually it's kind of weird that they play D&D &D right in the middle of, you know, FN, yeah, FNM. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, usually D&D &D for us was, like, Wednesdays, and FNM was, like, Magic was all day Friday. That's just the way yeah, it went. Yeah. Uh, but, so you're uh, saying, like, people playing EDH. All right, so elaborate more on that. So I think the big thing with this PvP kind of style, and, and so one of the things I like about the WoW TCG, when you bought the raid deck, there was always a raid treasure pack on the inside. It's like, hey, you know what? You can open this early and get the shinies, but if you want to actually beat the content and loot the reward, you're welcome to. Yeah. Um, so I think Flesh and Blood's always about rewarding the local game store. They want to make it better and help them thrive and survive. And Bring so it. someone comes Bring in. It. I someone, love it. Come so on, someone comes say in it. on a Friday night and they see everyone playing Flesh and Blood. It's like, well, what's all this? Well, we have a tournament going on right now, but we do have a raid deck that the, the, the store owner's wife will ever compile it for you. Um, and then the three or four casuals go over to the corner. Um, people pay like a dollar for entry. Um, but you kind of do the little raid deck thing. When you beat it, you get one of the treasure packs off the shelf and everyone gets the shinies. Like, who's going it. to hate on something like that? I love like it. That? I love so, it. So, like, 
It's expansion. It gets money into the store. It gets more traffic into the store. It gives people opportunities and different things to play. Where are we losing? There's there's nothing to lose. It's, it's a great advantage. I love it. The idea of giving the local game store something that could draw in players. I could bring my three friends who have never played the game and been like, dude, like, let's go. We get this cool loot. We get a fun thing. Have you played, you know, uh, World of Warcraft or a game that has loot? It's just like that. We can sit down. I'll teach you how to play. Even like you're saying, like the LGS owner could play as the enemy, right? Like it gives them something to do in the store or whatever. And yeah. then, like, they win and they get something, and A, it has some value. If the LGS owners aren't selling it on eBay like jerks, right, it has some value. It has they, – they played a game, they did a buy-in, and they get a $10 card, right? And they can say – if they if they're Magic the Gathering players, they can be like, oh, I'll sell this, and it feels good. Or if they're potential flesh and blood players, they're like, oh, man, like, I've got a cool card that I could then potentially – I think – I don't know that I would say that you could be able to use it in a – tournament i don't know i feel i feel like it could get a little out of hand if the card that you win from pve affects the game in pvp and in tournaments right like that could get that could get a little hard it's almost like uh in magic the adding we had the buy box promo uh what was that card that everybody hated nexus uh, of fate nexus of fate that you yeah. could only get if you bought a box and they ran out of them right. or whatever and it was like the best card in the game whatever like that could feel bad but like it, even so at that point, it's just supply and demand, right? So as long as they print plenty of these treasure packs, like regular normal booster packs, and maybe not the full ratio that you would do like a draft box, for example, um, but having the product out there where it's actually available and the singles hit the, the hit the market, I don't think it would be too bad. It was never an issue for the WoW TCG. Like, mm-hmm. I'll be honest, I went to my, my second pre-release, and I was buying the, the epic foil loot, like the gear for my Druid deck, and it was like $7 for this, $5 for that. And I was like, oh, that was, that's okay, cool. Yeah, take 20 bucks. I'll buy them all. Yeah. And I had my deck fully geared out, and I was good to go. I, but I also could see it just being like a treasure, right? Like just being mm-hmm. – like even if it was just like a – I don't know, like a cold foil of like a common card that's like – that that had some sort of tie back to the – or maybe it's alternate art, right? Maybe it's mm-hmm. a – Let's just throw out like a scar for scar that like the artwork is changed to uh, to the the raid boss or whatever. And, yeah, and, or, like, or, or maybe could... these treasure packs have a, a cold foil of light and strike as a possibility. One <laughs> out of every twenty boxes has something unique like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. so you're saying it's not the same card? You're saying it's like a loot? It's like you win a a promo pack, and that promo pack could be any number of cards. Potentially. Well, usually with the WoW TCG, your loot packs were like a special pool of like 40 cards within those packs. And then each pack was usually smaller. Um, so usually you got like two epics, like two or three rares, and the rest of them were Ooh, just uncommons. That's cool. And so they usually had a premium price. You were looking at, I think, I think when they first came out, they were like $10 a pack versus the regular like 3 or $4. But you got two epics and like two or three rares. Like It's like yeah. getting two Majestics and a couple rares. It's great. So you um, actually had to buy of... them after you after you beat the boss. You would have you'd get the chance to buy them, is what you're saying? Right, right. Okay, so you get cool. the raid deck originally that had one inside of it as like a supplement, like a reward, and then yeah. you could just go to your local game store to get extra packs for when you play on the weekends. That's sweet. I like it. I love, dude. I love your idea of like the store owner. I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more on like I think it would be cool if LGSs had special ones that weren't like you had the ones that you could do like I'm kitchen table TCG. Like I'm all about playing at home as well but like it could be really cool that you get one in the box right that has your like you're saying from the wow ones but i love Mm -hmm. your idea of like you go to the the local game store and just like you have armory kits you have a kit that's specific for pve content that you have to like build and work through at your lgs and at the end of the raid or at the end of the boss or whatever you get this cool promo that you can only get in that way just like the armory events right and, and what if those were preview kits? Like, oh, we have a new raid deck coming out this fall, but we're given all of the uh, LGS as a preview kit so people can go in their stores and actually try it for the first time. And you play that three or four months early, and you're like, oh, oh, I can't wait to get this and take it home for the friends. It's going to be really fun. Dude, you made me so excited for PvE. Like, just that last part. Like, I get so jazzed up about, like, uh, the loot. Like, that, that makes me so happy. And uh, yeah. And it's like, what if they hid like a fable in those? Like, I think the beautiful part about the fables is you don't need it to win. The fable yeah. can never kill your opponent. Well, potentially the Arc Knight Shard can get you enough rune chance, I guess, over time um, to, to actually do something. But the other two fables we have so far can't win the game. They're literally a treasure. And it, will it make you a little more efficient? Sure, it, it definitely can. Um, but it's not necessary. And that's the yeah. beauty of it. Like, it has value because you got lucky. And it makes you feel good when you get that chance. I'll be yeah. honest, the very last box 
of the WoW TCG I bought, I actually got one of the loot mount cards. It's worth like $3,000 today, but I sold it for 300 like an idiot. Um, but like those are the things you do, so I, I wasted yeah. my luck. I, I'll never open a Fable. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I understand. You will. You will. Um, one of these days you will. One day. Um, but like that's that's the beauty of like you got lucky. You found that treasure. Like that's what makes the game feel fun. If if everything's special, what is special? I love and so it. I hope they I hope they keep that alive. Well, what else do you have to say? We kind of I think we talked through most of the stuff. But you have anything else that you want to elaborate on or add? So there's one last point with the challenges I wanted to kind of hit on that I thought was interesting. One thing we look at with Flesh and Blood is, like, balance, right? So every hero that's been in print so far has an intellect of three or four. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about for balancing was, like, with the bosses. So say you have a dragon. It comes out with a baseline four intellect, but it gets a plus one intellect for each player you're fighting wow. against. Yeah. So one thing I was worried about is, like, okay, so say you're playing against a, a warrior – a guardian, a wizard, and then let's choose like mechanologist, for example. Those are two pretty aggressive classes that are going to hit you very, very hard. And so when you're the boss player and you kind of do your thing on your turn, reload your hand, gets the mechanologist's turn, they boost four times on you. Um, they go for the high velocity and they try to hit you for 10. You're like, I can't afford this. I'm going to throw two shards under there and block with this from my hand and I'm gonna move on to the guardian you see that crippling crush oh wow jeepers okay two more of those shards you're kind of like getting hit really hard part of that balancing would have to be in the intellect of the boss and so how many cards you have available to you and one cool thing on the wild tcg you can never lose as the boss deck with running out of cards your graveyard just shuffles back up and goes back into your deck yeah that's cool. um so you just kind of go heavy and hard defending how you need to and how you can and then kind of regrow from there but if they blow all their cards defensively you, they have no aggressive attacks on their turn. And that's part of the beauty of the whole flesh and blood balancing. Wow. Um, beyond that, the last thing I really had to touch on was this what if section like of the dungeon crawl. And it kind of goes back to that whole, there are no allies or minions in this game, like the wow TCG. So how do you balance like being swarmed? Cause it's not always just hero versus villain. Sometimes mm. it's like being at war. Like what we're seeing with the, the fab lore at this point is like you have uh, all of these regions and cities and cultures. Like, yeah. at what point is it going to be hero fighting hero versus nation fighting nation versus nations realizing there's a Leviathan alive and at play and the stake of their entire world and realm is at stake? Um, so, when you have that dungeon crawl environment, it's kind of like kicking in the door and you summon three, four, five, six mobs or whatever, and you have to kind of like cleave them down or AoE chain lightning through them and move on to the next room. Um, what, what do they want to do? with those cards do they want to be like mini heroes like how do they want to kind of go about that um and back to that last point that you made much earlier about like finding loot along the way um one thing the molten core deck does is as time goes on they have two resource rows uh the runes are a constant resource and they have like a minion deck resource row um and so every turn they get a minion from the deck put it in the resource row and every time you defeat one of the bosses the boss goes to the graveyard whatever's in your minion row flips up and you have to fight all of those with the next boss. Oh. So if you took six, seven, eight turns to kill that first boss, here's six, seven, eight minions for you to deal with now. Whereas so if you were pretty efficient, you only had one or two or whatever else. Wow, that sounds difficult. It, it was painful. We never beat Molten Core. It always, it always got us. Because uh, we never wanted to do the, the, the easy version. We always wanted to do the full clear because we were just stubborn. Yeah. Um, we are just MC Raiders. You know, We didn't have lives. But the last thing... I was thinking about is distribution of loot. So as where the Dragon Leviathan deck has this event deck happening, maybe, maybe you have this treasure trove kind of developing and growing with every action that you do. And once you defeat a room, you loot the room. That could have potions for sustainability, um, other potions that give benefits like Remembrance. I think it's a very, very important card. And I bought some of those at Foil when they first came out just because I knew it was going to be the most powerful card like 10 years from now. Yeah. They'll reprint it again, but I just wanted some first edition ones. Um, so you think like you're playing a classic constructed deck and you have 60 cards in it. You only have three crippling crushes, but you're ready to pound those bosses. That remembrance kind of puts it back in the deck for you, but you only do something like that so many times. So maybe as part of that distribution of loot, like you get potions to kind of shuffle, like maybe it's like restores memories or something like that. And you get spells back in your deck and you kind of refresh yourself mm. and get that tempo back to handle the next room or the next pressure you come across. And to that same point, why couldn't you find like legendary swords that are just part of the, tr the treasure deck? And it increases your damage by two, three, four, and just makes each fight that you go into much easier. So yeah, why couldn't you just replace your equipment or your gear with other uh, upgrades? And That's if you're cool. one of those ones where you use like the, the the tunic or something like that, 
well, I don't, I can't afford to lose this because it's too good for my rotation. Hey, how about you take this chess piece instead? It's better for you because I can't afford to lose mine. And so right. you have to work as that team to kind of distribute who needs what. So that's super cool. I like that. So do you think? But yeah. Do you think uh, was the wow one? Was it singleton or was it multiple cards in the deck? Um, as in like things to encounter? No, no, your your or... hero deck was the the deck singleton format like like edh or you can't have the same card twice or uh it... depends on the deck usually most of those raid decks had two copies um sometimes they only had one but how about uh, the hero decks? remember exactly how about the hero decks um with those yeah it's usually like two of a spell uh, okay so you... i'm talking about like the the people the good guys yeah. on their side um, t- typical constructed rules. I think it, I think with the Wild TCG, it was three copies. So you could bring, I like this, that you could bring your construct- constructed deck. You could be playing at the LGS. You could die and lose and be like, all right, I'm out of the tournament, whatever. If it's, you know, single Let's go do a raid. Now yeah. you could take that deck, your single deck, and go and raid. It might not be optimized for the raid, but you could at least go and, and try it out. Yeah, absolutely. I love yeah, it. Yeah, so you, you might be missing a little bit of utility pieces, but like... You're so yeah. okay. You're like, go experience it. That's all we want. Yeah. I love it. Dude, I appreciate you being on here. I am, like, I was excited for the conversation, and I was a little bit excited about the PvE stuff. Like, I love the idea of it. But now I'm like, I want to go buy the WoW TCG to practice because uh, <laughs> I can't wait for this. Like, I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah. So. Uh, dude, I appreciate you. Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to say before we? Uh, no, no, no. Go? I, I, I really appreciate you having me on here. It's actually nice talking about something like this to someone who actually cares to listen to it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes my friends have to kind of hear, oh, what if? Like back in the day, we were doing these things. What if they went about this way? They're like, we don't know. We, we, we. Sure, maybe they will. I hope your dreams come true. Yeah. Um, and as that PVE dreamer, you know, it's it's good to be able to actually have a conversation like this in an environment and actually say that what if. And actually kind of just like put something, you know, to the test. And so we'll see if something like this actually happens. It's pretty exciting. So. Yeah. And if you're still watching, uh, make sure you leave a comment for Quinn and thank him for being on the on the uh, on the episode. And Quinn, what's your uh, what's your YouTube name? Do you want to share it so that they can uh, like your comments or something like that? Oh, I actually go by my name, uh, Quinn. So you'll see me on the comments uh, every now and then. So Yeah. So when you um, see Quinn in the comment section, when you see Quinn in the comments of this video, you can ask him some questions and maybe he can answer them throughout there, too. And. I have a feeling that when PVE content is back or when it's released, I'm going to want to have you come on and, and share your opinions based on what they release. Uh, oh, I can't wait. And it would be can't super wait. cool. I know you're you're relatively close to me state-wise, and uh, maybe we can even set up something in, in post-COVID or whatever and get together and uh, do some videos and uh, go through a boss or something. That would be sweet. So. Absolutely. Would love to do that. Thanks for having me. I Dude, do appreciate I, it. I appreciate you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And most importantly, thank you for Quinn. Quinn, everybody else, remember be kind to the people around you. And uh, you might even find yourself next to them in a raid encounter and need their help. So make sure you're not a jerk to them. And uh, let's uh, go ahead and end this video. Quinn, thank you so much, dude. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.